Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and um, hope that everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and um, we welcome you back to our Friday morning program, uh, which um, I'm uh, very excited uh, about this morning's program, which features two speakers and a very um, experienced panel. Um, uh, by way of introduction, Dr. Sina Jazin is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Lipid Research at WashU in St. Louis. Um, she completed her endocrine fellowship at the Mayo Clinic and really has focused her career on thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. She is actively involved in both the ATA, where she served on the Guidelines and Statements Committee, as well as ACE. Um, she is currently the Editor-in-Chief of ACE Clinical Case Report <coughs> Journal. Um, this morning's discussion is Dr. Franklin Tesler, who is Emeritus Professor of Radiology at, Univers at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Um, starting in July 2018, Dr. Tesler assumed the role of Clinical of Chief Information Officer uh, throughout UAB medicine. Um, Dr. Tesla really needs no introduction. He's widely recognized for his expertise in ultrasonography. Uh, he was elected as a fellow of the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine, as well as in um, the Society of Radiologists in Ultrasound. Uh, he was recognized for his contributions by um, uh, receiving the Presidential Recognition Award by the AIUM. Of note, um, and very important uh, for this morning's discussion, is that Dr. Tesler is chairman of the American College of, Radi of Radiology Committee that developed the widely utilized TIRAD system uh, for risk stratification of thyroid nodules. Um, and so, um, in, even in addition to that, a uh, very esteemed uh, group of speakers, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Camilo Gonzalez from um, Mexico, as well as Dr. Lisa Orloff, both of whom have participated in this Friday morning um, panel. Dr. Orloff joins us from sunny California um, uh, from the University of Stanford. Um, Dr. Jasmine Tesler, uh, we look forward to your presentations and we'll go ahead and get started right now. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, and I was just saying that's a, such a beautiful morning from St. Louis in Central Time. A good reason to wake up for this um, nice effort. But I have, I think I can't complain with Dr. Orla from the <laughs> West Coast uh, waking up that early. So I appreciate everybody being on this call. Um, and welcome from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. This is our Washington University campus. And it's beautiful uh, in that view on the Forest Park. I have no disclosure relevant to this talk, and these are my objectives for today's uh, talk. So uh, when we talk about thyroid cancer risk assessment, um, we know that the prevalence of thyroid nodules are, are pretty common in the general population, but the prevalence of thyroid malignancy is, is less common, it's up to 15%. Um, and the, the estimated in new cases of thyroid cancer in USA is increasing, and reported to be 52,000 in 2019, with the increasing cost of thyroid, uh, thyroid cancer care in the United States. And therefore, we strive to look for Rizzler, who is Emeritus Professor of Radiology, try to adjust for that increasing pandemic of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Thyroid nodule evaluation, as we all know, is no longer one size fits all. And um, there are multiple features involved in evaluating thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer. There are the known clinical risk factor for thyroid malignancy that we obtain during history and uh, sonographic features that there are risk features that's more likely to increase or decrease the risk of thyroid cancer. We now use molecular testing. And so you can imagine there is now more and more modified therapeutic approach for uh, individualized patient plan. So I'm going to mainly focus for the purpose of my talk on the sonographic risk assessment systems. Uh, risk stratification approach that's uh, typically, there are multiple. There's the American Thyroid Association, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, American College of Radiology, Thyroids, and European and Korean Thyroids. So there are multiple, currently multiple risk stratification approach. 
while in the majority they don't disagree on the main features that increase or decrease the likelihood of um, thyroid nodule and the risk of thyroid cancer, there is some inter-observer and intra-observer uh, variability that could potentially lead to um, some differences when we talk about these. And that, that's why there is um, a, a growing international effort to unify the guidelines that incorporate clinical history and ultrasound uh, features to reduce these inter-observer variability. And uh, we are privileged today to have Dr. Tesla with us and Dr. Olaf to, to go over that kind of uh, collaboration. <clears throat> when we talk about risk scores, the um, suspicious uh, ultrasound features more or less are um, similar in, in multiple risk stratification systems. Uh, however, when we talk about the ATA or the ACER, it is mostly the um, pattern recognition of one or two uh, suspicious features that increase or decrease the likelihood of cancer. Uh, but when we talk about the American College of Radiology, the ACR Tyrax, there is a proposal and endorsed uh, a more um, unified scoring system based on five main uh, features, the composition, echogenicity, shape, margin, and echogenic foci. And according to each features, you assign a node and based on the amount of uh, points and the leading to TR or TIRAD uh, score and the recommendation for or against uh, biopsy. And generally the recommendations are either biopsy, follow-up, or no further follow-up. <clears throat> The suspicious sonographic features for malignancy in general include uh, things like echogenicity, hypoechogenic, or very hypoechogenic, and margins such as irregular margins, speculated margin. Um, but we all know sometimes even hypoechogenicity is not that specific. It might be sensitive, but not that specific. I uh, read in one of the thyroid presentation that most PTC are hypoechoic, but many hypoechoic nodules are benign. I, I don't remember who said that, as I can't really reference it, but it's very interesting because it's true. And so uh, some features, um, we can't rely on a single feature, it's usually more than one feature. So associated factors such as solid nodule, calcification, nodular flow, and so on. Taller than white is another feature that tend to be more specific actually, for the thyroid cancer. And when the AP to transverse ratio is more than one, this is an independent risk factor for, for PTC, even in small nodules, even if the nodule is less than one centimeter. Features such as micro calcification, punctate echogenic foci, or micro, macro calcifications are also included in the risk stratification. And the risk of cancer is higher with micro than macro calcification. When we talk about PEF, there is a lot of, I think that one, that's one of the features, there's a lot of inter-observer variability. In reality, up to 50% of the cases reported with P PEF were, were uh, reported as microcalcification on final pathology. So there's 50% of cases that's actually not microcalcification. So not every PEF is microcalcification. Sometimes the reading of that could upgrade or down, downgrade um, uh, the nodule. And there is a recent paper by our radiology group, by Dr. Tifi, that reported some punctate echogenic foci in mixed solid cystic nodules are less likely to be uh, a higher risk feature. So more to uh, know about these features in the future. So this is just to basically summarize that whatever I, I spoke about till now, these are intrinsic features of a thyroid nodule. So the intrinsic characteristic of a given nodule, how the nodule look like on ultrasound. So it's mainly ultrasound features and also the elastography and contrast enhanced sonography. But there are some non-intrinsic features such as lymph node involvement or extrathyroidal inv invasion, whether gross versus capsular bulging or discontinuity and what does that mean? And then location that became in the last few, few maybe two to three years uh, is more evident on, on some data that I'm gonna go over uh, in our study now. So the initial report of uh, thyroid nodule location and the risk of thyroid cancer was in 2019, uh, a reporter from New York studied 188 patients um, uh, over a year between 2016 and 17 and 
the sample size is not impressive. So uh, out of those patients, only 14 had malignancy, four cancer out of 18 in the upper pole, uh, two in the middle pole, and seven in the lower pole, and only one nodule that was cancer in the isthmus. So they divided it into isthmus upper, middle, and lower, and they looked at the risk of thyroid cancer in each um, location. And they found that the upper lobe is a higher risk of having uh, thyroid cancer. As you see, four out of 18 were cancerous. And even though when they adjusted to laterality and patient age and BMI and some other features, that held true. The theory is why that's was what's the mechanism why the upper pole is most likely to be uh, cancerous. Um, maybe because of dental and diagnostic irradiation, and these are just theories, or because of the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, um, because of the tortuous route of the venous drainage from the upper lobes compared to the uh, lower pole. They did conclude that the lower pole has the least risk of malignancy. That same year, there was another paper, also smaller sample size. The total was more than 500, but only 219 patients had um, uh, division of upper, middle, and lower uh, thyroid nodules. So for out, out of the 500, they, they didn't find laterality changes left and right. They were equally, the risk of cancer is equal. But when they looked at the sub uh, division of these cases of the 219 patients, which is 227 nodules, and divided them into upper, mid, and lower, they noticed that the middle lobe has a higher risk of thyroid cancer, followed by the upper uh, thyroid nodule. And then again, it's uh, agreed on the fact that lower thyroid lobe has the least risk of thyroid cancer. It is important to note that in that study, there was really not a lot of isthmus thyroid nodule to, to fit in, into that category. So the conclusion so far was middle thyroid lobe is most likely to uh, have more thyroid cancer compared to the upper and lower. <clears throat> but if you look at the table here, um, there was no isthmus region. So that back to that uh, question is, what is that? Is this true? Uh, is, is thyroid nodule location is a real fact, risk factor for malignancy? So we sought to seek that, that question and we looked at our existing data and this is basically the study that we did a couple of years ago by doing a, um, a secondary analysis of existing data. So it's a retrospective data analysis of existing thyroid nodule registry, which was actually just very worth uh, to know this is the database that was used for the evaluation of ACR tyrads a few years ago. So this is a multi-institutional study from six tertiary academic institutions in the United States. <coughs> uh, for patients who had thyroid uh, nodule biopsy between 2006 and 2010, the image analysis was um, done by two expert radiologists and features that were assessed are for composition, echogenicity, margin, echogenic foci, uh, size, location, and multiplicity. So as you can imagine, this is the original data of ACR tyrides. So looked at the five major features that we just touched up on. We added location into that category and we uh, <clears throat> roughly subdivided it into the isthmus, which is the middle region. And then in each lobe, we divided it per each third into upper, middle, and lower lobe. The, the cytology or surgical pathology report of resected specimens were all collected. So these were all available uh, cytology or confirmed pathology in, in majority of those patients. And uh, nodules with FNA results that was either benign or malignant, which is Bethesda 2 or, or, or 6, were considered diagnostic and were included for the purpose of that study for the final analysis. Um, any other nodule that did not have a final pathology were excluded unless there is a subsequent definitive FNA or um, pathological data available. So this flowchart summarizes um, what we've done. We started with 3419 nodules, and then we excluded 117 because we miss, we're missing the location data. 
And we then excluded 61 nodules because the, they occupy the entire lobe, so it didn't really fit into the upper, middle, or lower. So we ended up with 32, 41 nodules in final analysis. Out of those, 335 were malignant. Uh, majority, as you can imagine, were uh, female patients. We looked at their race, ethnicity, family history, uh, risk of radiation exposure, and multiplicity as additional risk factors. Um, if we look at here, as far as laterality, we looked at left, right, and isthmus. Uh, about 195 uh, nodules were in the isthmus region, only 34 were malignant. This is not really far from uh, what's been reported, the isthmus thyroid cancer uh, range, prevalence range between 1 to 9 percent. So that fit into that uh, distribution. And then we looked at their uh, distribution, both mal malignant and benign, into upper, middle, and lower and isthmus region. And we divided them here into uh, per, per each uh, upper, middle, lower, and isthmus region. And we looked at the ACR Tyras distribution, all these locations, and we looked at the size. We noticed that the size for isthmus nodule cancer here was the smallest, so they tend to be the smallest. Um, not much different from the upper lobe, but certainly different from the middle and lower lobe. We did have a regression analysis to look at features such as composition, echogenicity, um, and margin, um, they were all significant independent risk factor, but this is no surprise since these are known risk factors and also because the database is actually is the one used for ACR thyroids. But we throw in the um, location as an independent factor to look if this will be also significant, and it was independent risk factor to increase the risk of malignancy in that model. We run a univariate analysis and multivariate analysis to look at to adjust for certain features such as age, sex, family history, radiation exposure, size, and the thyroid um, factors such as the echogenicity margins and others. And we noticed that the risk of the uh, thyroid cancer was much higher in the isthmus region, 2.4, so almost twice as uh, usual followed by uh, upper thyroid nodule, middle thyroid nodule, and the lower. So I think our study agreed with the previous two studies that the lower thyroid um, lobe has the least likelihood of having thyroid cancer in their nodules. Um, the isthmus actually has the highest risk of, being uh, of the nodule having uh, a thyroid cancer, followed by the upper, then middle. When we adjusted for all these factors, this uh, relationship held true and it remained to be almost double 2.4 times more likely to be cancerous. And this despite the smallest being the smallest in size, and this is despite being the um, least in frequency. It was interesting that same year, there was another uh, paper that came from Brazil that actually supported our findings. So this, this database is much larger, it's almost 10,000, but it's mainly cytology data, not uh, a lot of pathology, but actually up to 70% of these data were confirmed by pathology. But at least they reported it here, isthmus right and, and, and left lobes. So they, they compared the isthmus to both lobes. Um, and if you look at the malignant risk, it was 8% in the isthmus region compared to 3%, 3.6% in the right lobe and 3.1% in the left lobe. Um, this uh, difference was significant. And I think this, uh, the only uh, drawback in the study, they did not have the um, subdivision into upper, middle, and lower but it definitely supported that the risk of thyroid cancer is much higher, almost double, uh, in the isthmus region compared to uh, the lower thyroid nodules. So this particular paper suggested few theories. One of them is the embryologic nature of the gland, because I think the next question when we say isthmus nodule are more likely to be cancerous, even though they're the smallest and the least frequent. 
it begs the question, why? What's the mechanism for that? So one of the theories is embryological nature of the gland. The early formation of the thyroid lobe would depend on the incorporation of two lateral analgae derived from the ultimobranchial bodies. The isthmus would be a remnant of the median analgae that developed from the primitive pharynx. So that potentially could reflect a different cellular composition and higher association with the malignant serous. We also propose that isthmus might be less, um, there's less thyroid tissue, so any process could be more prone to uh, neoplastic rather than hyperplastic process. Another theory that malignant nodules in the isthmus are probably smaller, so they probably get to be um, followed or dismissed. And there's less defined sonographic features, uh, such as taller than wide, and I'll get to that study that's not very well described in isthmus nodule. So why we, why we care about uh, that association? What do we know about isthmus uh, DTC behavior? And it's important to note here when I'm talking about thyroid nodule location and risk of thyroid cancer, this is pertaining to differentiated thyroid cancer. As medullary, we all know it's probably, it, it's unique in its location. So in this uh, particular study, most of these data actually are surgical uh, data. So there've been some surgical data, and I'd be very interested to hear Dr. Olive's uh, point of view, that there, there are some literature suggesting that there's different frequency and pattern of central lymph node metastasis in papillary thyroid cancer in the isthmus. And, um, the isthmus, uh, if in this particular study, they had a, a group of 45 patients that have isthmus PTC compared to non-isthmic PTC, about 150, as a comparable group. And they matched them by age, by uh, pathology, by risk. So more or less, they have similar risk features. And they noticed that the isthmus uh, group had higher rates of metastasis to the pretracheal and bilateral paratracheal lymph nodes than the non-ismic control group. Now, this is probably not a surprise given the different lymphatic drainage of the isthmus region um, and also the worry about the proximity to the trachea. This was also supported by additional study that was just published in 2020 when they studied uh, 87 patient ismic group and then 87 patient control group. Both have uh, PTC both group underwent total thyroidectomy and bilateral central neck dissection. And they noted that the bilateral paratracheal lymph node metastasis was significantly associated with multiple factors, including age less than 55, capsular invasion, if the terminology of capsular in, in, um, involvement is, is, um, is correct. Tumor location, actually, isthmus was one risk factor for uh, bilateral paratracheal lymph node metastasis and BRAF uh, mutation, and of course, pretracheal lymph node metastasis. There was actually one study that I was able to see, but I didn't mention it here because of the small sample size, that isthmus nodule, isthmus thyroid cancer are more likely to have distant metastasis on whole body scans when compared with lower. PTC. Uh, just actually most recently in 2021, there was another paper that reported lateral lymph node metastasis in a T1A PTC uh, is more likely to be seen with uh, nodules or with cancer in the upper lobe, not in the isthmus lobe. Um, it is important to note, however, that the isthmus tumor in that particular study were not measured differently, they were included within the middle lobe. So that kind of like biased the study and the isthmus was completely um, out, of the, out of the equation. Um, but there are a couple of studies also reporting on that. So we have some sense that isthmus seems to be at higher risk, followed by the upper as high risk location. And we, when we talk about ultrasound finding in papillary thyroid carcinoma that comes from the isthmus region, there's not really a lot other than this paper. When they compared 48 patients with a classic PTC located in the isthmus to a comparative group of lower PTC in 96 patients as a control group, and they all underwent preoperative ultrasound imaging. They underwent total thyroidectomy and bilateral central lymph node dissection 
and then post-operative follow-up up to two years. The main feature that this study looked at, that the isthmus nodules are less likely to have a taller than wide shape than the nodules in the lobe. And this is important because um, I mentioned this is one of the most specific features and we can't really measure that in the isthmus uh, lesion. They also mentioned that the, um, they're more likely to have extra thyroidal extension, but I think there was some disagreement or criticism as far as what's the definition of of that on images, since it's a, oftentimes it's a, it's a pathology term. <clears throat> so because of all of that, we, we have some surgical literature that suggests the uh, risk of uh, um, metastasis, at least the local regional metastasis with isthmus thyroid cancer is higher in the isthmus region. And maybe there is some justification for that. It's a different lymphatic drainage, a proximity to the trachea and surrounding structures that could potentially lead to that. But it's not clear why the nodule itself is at higher risk for thyroid cancer. But because of that, we uh, sought to look for um, if, if location is actually an independent risk factor for thyroid cancer, is it appropriate to add it to the risk stratification model of the ACR tyrad that typically study five main features, composition, echogenicity, margin shape, and echogenic foci? And what happened if we added location to that? So we use the same exact database, and uh, I will not go over it again, but we have uh, 3241 cases and 335 uh, cancer, subdivided into upper, mid, lower, and isthmus. And we created five revised algorithms, and to compare it to the original ACR tyrides. When we added uh, one additional uh, score to a higher risk location, so version one, we added one more point to the isthmus location. Version two, we added one to isthmus, one to upper. Version three, we added two points for the isthmus, one for the upper. Version four, we added two, no, two score for the two points for the isthmus and two points for the upper. And then the last version, we had two for isthmus, two for upper, and one for middle. Um, we didn't really add any point to the lower because that's, there is an agreement that's the least likely to be cancerous. We studied sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive value, and accuracy. And in this, uh, we considered a positive recommendation as FNA only, or FNA or follow-up as a positive, because these are the current recommendation of ACR thyroids. Negative is basically no further follow-up. We also looked at the ratio of benign to malignant nodules with a positive recommendation. So the, the first version here, when the FNA, when the positive recommendation is FNA only, um, this table showed the, um, each revision and how this affected the sensitivity, the specificity, positive, negative, predictive value, and accuracy. And you notice here uh, the version uh, two onward has decreased, significantly decreased specificity and obviously accuracy as well. The only version that didn't really make a change or a difference from the original tyrod is revision one, when we only added one uh, point for isthmus location. Everything else has kind of like declined the performance of ACR tyrods. When the recommendation was positive for either FNA or follow-up, the um, Revision 5 has much higher sensitivity, but the specificity definitely declined and also the um, sensitivity, the, the accuracy. And the only versions that did not change from the original is revision 1 and 2, when we added one nodule, one score for isthmus and one score for upper. So then we looked at the ratio of additional benign to malignant nodule when the recommendation is only FNA. And when we looked at revision one, it sounded like we have to biopsy 41 benign nodule to diagnose four cancer. So each additional cancer detected would require FNA of 10 additional benign nodule. Now that might not be far from the, the prevalence of thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer, which is 10 to 15% in general. And applying revision one to our database would have recommended an FNA for additional four malignant 
and 41 benign isthmus nodule. Similarly, if the outcome, the positive outcome or recommendation is FNA or follow-up, we, we notice that the ratio of additional benign to malignant nodule with a recommendation of FNA or uh, follow-up um, is eight. So each additional cancer detected require FNA or follow-up of eight additional benign nodule. And applying that revision one to our database has led to the recommendation of FNAing or follow-up of additional four malignant nodule and 32 benign isthmus nodule. Then the question would be, is that clinically important? I uh, copy pasted this from the ACR original paper that basically say the ACR thyroid is designed to balance the benefit and identifying clinically important cancer against the risk and cost of subjecting patients with benign nodules or indolent cancer to biopsy and treatment. So based on the data I showed, we felt strongly to advocate for meticulous, at least meticulous examination of the isthmus region during thyroid sonography because of the lower, a smaller size and the higher cancer risk of nodules in this location. In addition, adding one point to a higher risk location uh, in general degraded the performance of pretty much all the revisions except adding one point to the isthmus. So that didn't really affect or degraded the current ACR thyroid. So it might be okay to implement. However, that might be simply because of the small size of the isthmus uh, thyroid cancer in general that probably didn't have any statistically different uh, outcome from the original thyroids. So definitely prospective studies are warranted to assess that impact of this revision on the risk stratification and management systems. An additional question might be relevant is the potential mechanism why this is um, more likely to be cancerous in the isthmus region. And what are the images and sonographic features of the isthmus PTC? Would that require further studying? And what's the surgical approach and outcomes? We all know um, some surgery advocate for isthmusectomy, some recommend total thyroidectomy, and I'll be very eager to hear Dr. Orloff's opinion on that. Um, and this is uh, all I have to present. Thank you very much for listening. Good morning. I'm Franklin Tesler from the University of Alabama at uh, Birmingham. That's in the USA, not the one in the UK. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of the Thank Foundation for inviting me to participate in this session today. If you're wondering why I uh, have a picture of Bill Nye, the science guy, on the introductory slide, first of all, he reminds us the importance of science in everything we do. And second, his bow tie reminds me of a thyroid gland. This is my disclosure. You've already heard Dr. Jassim eloquently describe the conduct and results of the uh, study uh, on uh, the effect of uh, thyroid nodule location and the risk of thyroid cancer. And the reason that I am here is that I was asked to uh, write a commentary on this paper, which was published in the same um, uh, journal at the same time. And I think this raises four questions, several of which Dr. Jassim has talked about, so I won't dwell on them uh, that relate to this. First, does a nodule's location predict malignancy? Second, does a location of the nodule predict its, the aggressiveness? Should isthmus cancers be managed differently? And then last, what does this mean for risk stratification systems and guidelines? And it is number four on which uh, I will mostly concentrate. Let's start off with the first question. You've already heard Dr. Jassim present uh, some of the results I'm about to show you in greater detail, so I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, this paper from 2019 with a small number of nodules, eight in the isthmus, a little over 7% being malignant, and the highest malignancy likelihood it was in the upper pole. Another paper, Ramundo, from 2019, also a small number of nodules, uh, 
less than 6% malignant, highest malignancy likelihood in the middle lobe. And then Dr. Jassim and coworkers gave her with a much larger number of nodules from that database that she described, which was, I believe, the strength of this paper, 10.3% uh, malignant and highest malignancy likelihood in the isthmus. What does nodular location do in terms of predicting aggressiveness? And you've heard Dr. Jassim talk about this a little bit as well. This was looked at back in 2010 in a paper that uh, dealt with 1,973 patients, 181 nodules in the isthmus, all papillary cancers. And these cancers were shown to have more capsular invasion and multifocality. A small study, 94 patients, 47 in the isthmus in 2017, again, all papillary cancers with higher rate of capsular invasion and central nodal metastases for the ismic tumors. And finally, earlier this year, a larger study of over 1,700 patients. In this case, they looked at not specifically isthmus tumors. They talked about tumors being near the isthmus that is partially overlapping the isthmus and the uh, corresponding lobe, of which there were 146. Again, all papillary and more central nodal metastases in the near isthmus tumors. What does this mean regarding management? And uh, I'll be very interested to see what Dr. Orloff and the other pan panelists think about this, but highlighting two papers from this year. One was a meta-analysis of 11 studies, all papillary cancer. And I think that's important because um, the, uh, uh, the risk stratification systems focus on papillary cancer, and there, has been, there have been questions raised about how well they perform for other less common types of cancer, such as medullary. In any case, in this uh, one paper, isthmus cancers had higher rates of central nodal metastases and higher recurrence rates. In another paper from this year as well, small number of patient, relatively small number of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer post-thyroidectomy and RAI, and uh, those patients who had isthmus cancers were shown to have incomplete biochemical or structural response that was uh, uh, higher than for other locations. I want to spend most of the time on trying to answer this question. What does this work, work by Dr. Jassim and others regarding location of thyroid nodule cancers, mean for risk stratification systems and guidelines. And to do that, I want to take a little bit of a trip backward in time. This was from a chapter by Dr. George Leopold, who was uh, many years at UC San Diego. If uh, radiologists tend to be more familiar with uh, his work, but he was indeed one of the pioneers of uh, ultrasound. And this chapter was about the applications of ultrasound in looking at uh, superficial structures, including the thyroid gland. And on the left, you see uh, in this figure an adenoma pointed to by the arrow with the letter A in it. You see a little bit of the thyroid tissue around it. And then on the right, a carcinoma, a small nodule with some calcifications in it. Whether I would construe those as microcalcifications or not, I'm not sure from this picture. But more importantly, Dr. Leopold made a very prescient statement, and he talked about the fact that many individuals who are examined at autopsy have tiny foci of carcinoma within the thyroid gland that are really incidental. And he speculated that it's possible that some of those would be visualized by ultrasonography. And remember, this was more than 40 years ago, and the quality of ultrasound images has improved significantly since then. And he asked a question, is it appropriate to question whether these lesions would ever have become clinically significant? And that's something that we're wrestling with now more than 40 years later. We know that there are many nodules in the thyroid gland, uh, most of which are either benign or indolent cancers. And uh, when I read thyroid ultrasound, if uh, the I'm looking at images and there are no thyroid nodules. I almost wonder if there was something that was missed because it's uncommon for us to see a completely normal looking thyroid gland. Uh, by palpation, uh, not many 
thyroid nodules are uh, detected. Autopsy, this is the famous study by Mortensen from the 1950s, which found 50%. And then ultrasound is able to detect in a, at least, it's, I think it's actually pro probably more than this, but in this paper uh, that was published in 2009, 68% of nodules were found on high resolution ultrasound. So the question before us all is how do we pick the right ones? And this is the chart from the ATA 2015 guidelines that I'm sure you were all familiar with and uh, was shown before with the uh, various patterns going from benign at the bottom to high suspicion at the top uh, with higher malignancy risk for the more suspicious ones and the size for recommending FNA on the right. As you go up in risk, the FNA size threshold goes down. This is the chart that Dr. Desim already showed. This is from our white paper in 2017 on ACR TIRADS, and I won't uh, reiterate uh, what was already said, except to say that this is a points-based system. There was a lot of discussion before we did this about whether to go with points or patterns or something in between, and we elected to go with uh, points. One last note I'll make is that all this material at the bottom of the chart in each of the five feature categories was designed to clarify the decision making because we thought that this chart would be uh, either posted uh, in reading rooms uh, to be consulted or available electronically and we wanted that uh, guidance to be available during interpretation. There have been hundreds of articles comparing the performance of these risk stratification systems over the years. And I don't want to dwell on the differences. I want to ask a different question. Are they really so different? And I'm going to highlight this. This is a, uh, something I looked at a few years ago to try to see how much the ATA guidelines and the ACR TIRADS guidelines vary. So for these seven patterns, they're completely concordant. You see on the right again, there are two columns showing FNA size for the ATA and then the ACR. And these are completely concordant. So these systems are identical for these seven types of nodules. For these additional three, their only difference is a, a change of one half centimeter, five millimeters, in the recommended threshold for biopsy. For these TR3 nodules, which are in the low suspicion category, the difference is greater. It is one, one centimeter. So for these nodules, the, um, uh, the ATA would recommend biopsy at one and a half centimeters versus two and a half centimeters for ACR tirads. And the biggest uh, difference is for these very low suspicion nodules, TR1 or TR2, uh, for which the ACR recommends uh, no biopsy, but the ATA says to consider if greater than equal to two centimeters. And the difference in size thresholds has been looked at by several investigators, including Dr. Grani, who published this in 2019, looking at five different risk stratification systems and highlighting here in the last three columns the size thresholds and contrasting them to ACR TIRADS. So that leads to the question, what if you changed just the size thresholds without changing anything else? And Dr. Ha and coworkers from South Korea asked this question and answered it in this publication in radiology in 2019, looking at the ATA 2015 and the Korean Thyroid Association, Korean Thyroid uh, uh, Society of Thyroid Radiology 2016 guidelines. And let me focus in on these two, because what they did was simulations and by lowering the thresholds and simulation six, they made the size thresholds for ATA and KTA, KS, uh, THR identical. And these are the results for two of the measures that they looked at, starting off with specificity, concentrating on simulation six, you could see that the values are pretty close to the ACR TIRADS value here in green. And similarly, looking at the unnecessary biopsy rate, I think we can all agree that uh, 
doing fewer unnecessary biopsies of benign nodules is, is a good thing. And here again in simulation six, by just changing the size thresholds, they were able to get the performance to match much more closely. These are the Corinne Society of Thyroid Radiology guidelines from 2016. And I'm going to show this to show that the uh, South Korean uh, investigators have actually put this into practice. This is the 2016 guidelines and just published a month or so ago are the 2021 guidelines from the same group. And I'm going to superimpose on that the FNA thresholds from 2016. And you can see what they've done between 2016 and 2021 is decrease the size thresholds. For example, here for the low suspicion, they've gone from one and a half to two. For intermediate suspicion, from um, what greater than equal to one to greater than one to 1.5 and so on. So just by changing the size thresholds and essentially taking the advice that was suggested in that paper that I showed a, a moment or two ago, um, they've actually put that into practice. And Dr. Jasim talked about this uh, paper that uh, she and her co-workers did to see how changing uh, ACR tirads to accommodate the location of nodules in the isthmus would make it, if that could make a difference. And again, focusing on these results, the difference was certainly uh, was uh, not great. I think uh, more work needs to be done, done on this to see how specifically to incorporate location into risk stratification systems. But I do think that's something that will have to be done. So here we are in 2021 and we have, this is just a subset, 12 systems out there of which no fewer than seven are called TIRADS. The reason for that is the origin of the acronym TIRADS, which stands in all cases for thyroid imaging reporting and data system which is really modeled on ACR BIRADS for breast imaging, which has achieved worldwide uh, acceptance. What's the problem with all these systems? First, if you have many systems, there can be confusion for practitioners and patients. So for example, in one, uh, one report may actually have in some locations, uh, evaluations based on more than one system. There's a lot of duplication of effort in updating multiple systems around the world, and it's difficult to keep up with advancements in writing these systems and guidelines because of their multiplicity. So as you already heard from Dr. Jassim, this led to the development or formation of the International Thyroid Nodule Ultrasound Working Group. I came up with this idea in late 2017 because I uh, thought that having so many systems was so confusing. And I thought, why not explore this possibility? And so I wrote to the lead authors of some of the existing guidelines, asking if they would be interested in cooperating on a harmonized system. I expected to be completely blown off, by the way. And to my great surprise, uh, there was a lot of interest in doing this. So we started organizing in 2018 and uh, formed a steering committee that represents professional organizations that have developed uh, or published risk stratification systems and guidelines, including the ATA, the um, AAC, AACE, ACE, AME, which published a uniform medical guideline, the American College of Radiology, the European Thyroid Association, and the Korean Society of Thyroid Radiology and the Korean Thyroid Association. So all these organizations are represented. This is where our activities uh, are. Uh, this is how we planned them. We divided our work into two phases. The first, to develop a universal lexicon for describing thyroid nodules and ultrasound and publish an online atlas. And phase two, to create a risk stratification system based on the lexicon and uh, based on multiple features and uh, modified by factors, including nodule location, which I've highlighted here, but other factors that uh, should influence the decision whether to biopsy or not. Importantly, my vision here is not to say that we're going to be points-based, pattern-based, or some intermediate, because I think that uh, different practitioners will uh, be more accepting of one way of doing it than the others. My hope is that we come up with a system that takes a given nodule 
and essentially puts it through the system, either points pattern or intermediate, and comes up with the same uh, risk stratification. And this is the structure of phase one. Uh, Dr. Cosimo Durante, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is leading this effort for subgroups based on uh, different uh, Cat, the different categories of features, each with four to five physician members. Where we stand as of December 21 is we are nearing consensus on the lexicon via a modified Delphi process. I expect it, and uh, Dr. Orloff will, I think, uh, agree with this. We really wanted to be much further ahead than where we are now, but an inconvenient thing called the uh, COVID-19 pandemic interfered and slowed our work. But I think we are making good progress here. Will we be successful in developing a universal TIRADS? Well, um, I hope so, but if we are, it'll only apply here. This uh, famous photo is an updated version of the so-called pale blue dot. That is the planet Earth as photographed by the Voyager 1 probe on Valentine's Day in 1990 from a distance of 6 billion kilometers, which is 3.7 billion miles. So whatever system we develop will only apply here, but if we're successful with that, I'll be happy. With that, thank you so much for your attention. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Jassim and Dr. Tesler. Those were both outstanding presentations. Um, since location of thyroid nodules is really at the core of this discussion in part, um, based on the paper that was presented, I have to ask whether or not there really is any data that looks at geographic differences within the thyroid with respect to cellular composition, um, aside from what we know um, in the superior pole, or anything different in the microenvironment that was speculated um, um, based on uh, differences, I, I guess, in venous drainage, which is hard to imagine. Is there any hard data um, that would go along with that? Dr. Chessie? Yes, um, so the short answer is no, to, to my knowledge. Um, there's a, of course, the lymphatic drainage is, is well documented uh, in the anatomy and surgical literature. But when I tried to look into the microenvironment and whether or not this correlates with the higher risk, I really couldn't find anything. Um, we applied for one of the ATA grants to try to look into even some of the molecular changes or the genetic changes. It didn't go through, but but I, I looked at the literature and I couldn't find anything solid that could potentially explain this phenomena biologically. Great. Um, let me just um, I challenge uh, both of you for, for one moment before I open this up. Um, in a patient's mind, um, they're, they have a very binary approach to a, when they're told about a thyroid nodule. Um, is this malignant or is this benign? And in many, most instances, coming from the perspective of a surgeon, that's really what they want to know. And so, I guess the question is, um, uh, do you, in applying a lo geographic location um, to the decision to biopsy or not, um, how do you think, uh, or do you think ultimately this will answer the fears of patients who um, have, are told that they've got a thyroid nodule in one part of the thyroid versus another? So. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and then let Dr. Tesler also uh, respond to that. What this, this, this work has shaped our practice in a way that, um, again, the, the, the sonographic suspicious features more or less are similar regardless of the location, except for the taller than wide in the isthmus region. But because of these data, if I see uh, a suspicious lesion or you know intermediate lesion in the isthmus, I tend to biopsy even if it's less than one centimeter, which the current recommendation might not necessarily suggest a biopsy. So we've been more meticulous, more vigilant, more likely to probably biopsy intermediate to high suspicious nodule despite the size, because it's not, it, based on the data, it didn't really correlate with size. 
And uh, I think that's one of the, the things that I discuss with my patients when we decide whether or not to biopsy or not. Yeah, ultimately, I think location will be one of, there's so many other factors that go into it. And I actually spend more time talking to patients than I do performing biopsies because I, I speak to them before, after I do the ultrasound at, at, on which the decision to biopsy will be often be made. And I talk to them about the, uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's, it's binary in their minds, but I always describe that uh, if they do, we do go ahead and do a biopsy, it's not going to be a bina binary result. So the, I, I talk to them uh, to the extent that they want to hear it about the uh, Bethesda classification and the intermediate uh, categories, especially three and four, and what the, the rabbit hole they're essentially jumping in by having the biopsy. The other factor is that I think important to talk about is that there's um, a tr trend, increasing trend toward uh, doing uh, active surveillance or active monitoring, uh, as many people call it. And I think that is going to add to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, mix of what we discussed with, uh, with patients uh, about this. Was um, done by two experts. Can I open this up to uh, Dr. Um, Gonzalez and uh, Dr. Orloff here? Um, if either or both of you would like to comment or ask uh, further questions. I'll go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I First, I would really just like to commend both Dr. Josephine and Dr. Tesler on such elegant presentations, which represent even more elegant compilation of a lot of uh, work and research. I mean, these are, these are seminal contributions to our um, moving the field forward. So um, it, I, it, it's a privilege to join you. And um, I, in the in the little bit of time that's left, I guess I would just um, add that, uh, as you said, Dr. Erkin, from a clinical standpoint, there's sort of the binary mindset of the patient. Um, from the clinician standpoint, I think Dr. Tesla mentioned, um, you know, how do we pick the right ones when we're looking at nodules to biopsy? And I guess. Um, I think about in isthmus nodules, how do we how do we not miss the wrong ones? And um, I, it seems sort of a take home point is that the isthmus uh, region is more prone to malignancy, perhaps, but also um, it, the characteristics of it. It's it, it, tumors behave more aggressively. The the limited data that we have, but these tumors are more superficial. They present earlier. They have less thyroid to buffer them from the viscera. Um, and um, they... Um, it was interesting that... Very ...heightened sensitivity toward isthmus nodules. Um, the, uh, all of this really gets back to something that I harp on all the time, but it's just the quality of ultrasound and the detail of reporting. And I think we, we see that isthmus nodules in the midline are recognized as such, but sometimes nodules are described as isthmus nodules when they're sort of in the medial portion of the right or left lobe, and that generates some confusion. Um, it's important to realize that sometimes a nodule that looks like it's in the isthmus might be a metastatic uh, prelaryngeal lymph node or involving the pyramidal lobe or the thyroglossal duct. So these are all sort of confounding variables. And, um, I'll leave a moment for Camilo to, <laughs> to add to that because I know we're, we're short on time. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I would like to echo uh, Dr. Orloff's uh, congratulations on your, both of yours. Um, talk to what these were amazing. I, I mean, I have my page full of questions uh, for you, but uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the first thing would be, in your, in your experience, have you found any... Um, any uh, research or any evidence based on autopsy that um, recognizes the higher aggressiveness or risk of malignancy of thyroid nodules in this region. The second question would be um, based on what uh, Dr. Jasim was saying that we, we need to uh, follow a very uh, concise and comprehensive evaluation of the isthmic region. Is there a protocol that you follow? And, and to what Dr. Olaf was saying, like limiting what the isthmic region is based on the different anatomic presentations that a patient may have 
and the and the third uh, uh, path or the third um, cyst or cyst or uh, or remnants of, of it that could have if you find anything besides a thyroid nodule in the ismic region, do you call that extra thyroid extension or is it just part of one same lesion? That defining those things, I think, are very important to us because taking action from what we um, what we reported in the ultrasound is going to be crucial in the next steps that are taken. So what would you say are the key elements of, of communication to uh, help our, our surgeons do a better job when they find these uh, findings? Yeah, I'll just respond briefly because I know we're about out of time, but I think meticulous attention to detail is required both in the conduct of the uh, of the ultrasound. One of the things we've found useful at UAB for, for decades is the use of video clips during our ultrasound because that makes it much easier to, rather compared to a static image, to decide after the fact, after the patient is left, maybe you want to modify uh, your uh, description of where, where a nodule is. So it's attention to detail in terms of technique, and then attention to detail in terms of reporting. Um, I'm a big proponent, and ACR Tyrads has helped with this, of structured reporting that uh, provides much more uniformity in the way we report things in terms of location and, and uh, ultrasound features. So I think both those things are, are vital. Terrific. I, I am sorry that, um... I have to interject here because we are up against the nine o'clock hour here on the East Coast. Um, I can't thank uh, Dr. Jasim and Dr. Tesler enough and thank um, uh, Camilo and Lisa for um, providing really expert uh, questions and comments here. Um, thank you uh, to everybody. Everybody stay safe wherever you are in the world and um, look forward to a presentation next week um, from Dr. Michael Zing. Um, who will be reporting on uh, some of his work and targeted therapy for thyroid cancer. Everyone, thank you for joining us and um, uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care. Have a great day.